Tom, welcome to RTC, Doctor. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you. Ramadan Mubarak, if you say Arabic, Doctor. Thank you, thank you. They're a bit tired. It's only that we are tired today. We're getting used to it, Ramadan. <laughs> Doctor, uh, I would like to, to, to uh, introduce the CSID, the Center for the Study of Islam and Democracy, which is normally based in DC, but you have a new office in Tunis. Uh, yes, actually we now have two uh, separate organizations, one in uh, Washington and the one in Tunis is actually registered mm -hmm. under Tunisian law as an independent uh, organization with the mm -hmm. same name, uh, Center for the Study of Islam and Democracy. Mm -hmm. The one in Washington has been uh, in operation for about 13 years now, it was established in 1999. Mm -hmm. uh, of course the one in Tunis is uh, much newer and was established uh, just last year after the revolution. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, our main activities are basically to promote the idea that Islam and democracy are compatible, that the principles and values of democracy are compatible with the principles and values of Islam. I would like to ask you one question, Doctor. You have said that um, Islam and democracy are compatible. Mm -hmm. Some people do not think, believe that they are not compatible at all. Yes, of course, and, and that's why we created the center uh, again about 13, 14 years ago. We felt that uh, there is a lot of misunderstanding among a lot of people, uh, mm -hmm. especially of course in the Western world, in America and in Europe, about what Islam really says and what Islam teaches. Mm -hmm. um, there is a very negative, unfortunately, very negative image of Islam in, in America and in Europe. Um, and also among Muslims that uh, about 14 years ago there were a lot of Muslims who believed that uh, democracy is uh, alien to Islam, is mm -hmm. foreign to Islam, that uh, uh, you know Islam teaches a di uh, or has a different system for government which can be sometimes intolerant and, and uh, not very uh, democratic. So this is why we established the center it, because mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to really study uh, the, the topic in great depth. Uh, we organized uh, hundreds of uh, seminars and meetings and conferences both in the United States as well as in the Arab world mm -hmm. and also the Islamic world outside of the Arab world uh, on these issues and we brought the best scholars, the best uh, uh, experts uh, on democracy as well as on Islam itself and we had uh, you know lots of discussions between the experts about these values, mm -hmm. you know, what are the main pillars of democracy, what are the main pillars of Islam, and uh, to, to see if there is really any incompatibility between the two. So this is what we've been doing for yeah. the last 14 years. Dr. Masmoudi, how do you talk about Islam and democracy? We organize uh, conferences that are open to the public. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, we have uh, seminars and meetings and lectures. We travel uh, all over the United States, not only in Washington. Mm -hmm. And we participate in uh, major conferences. We have a publication which is called The Muslim Democrat. We have, of course, a website, uh, and so we are very active in in Washington. Um, I, CSID is very well known in in, mm -hmm. in Washington. And, so. and why did you choose to come back to Tunis to establish? Well, first of all, I am Tunisian, so I've always been going back and forth. You know, this is my country also, and mm -hmm. I, I feel very proud uh, of of being Tunisian. And. Uh, I, after the revolution, I felt that this we had a historic uh, moment and a historic opportunity mm -hmm. that we had really uh, to do everything we can to make sure that we succeed in this uh, difficult transition from dictatorship to democracy. Uh, as we all know, this is a difficult phase. It's, a, it's, a, it's not easy to, to, to transition from a culture uh, of, dictatorship, of dictatorship, of dictatorship, and one man rule, and you know one party rule, and you know people actually being afraid of each other, and people not uh, listening and not talking to each other, mm -hmm. uh, to to move to a, a, a true democratic system uh, takes time, and it's a very difficult process, and that's why we decided to really focus a lot of our time and our energy mm -hmm. on Tunisia uh, to make sure that Tunisia succeeds in the uh, transition. Where is the priority of the CSID in Tunisia? When you, when you organize conferences, do you talk about the, uh, the constitution, do you talk about the current political situation, do you bring in experts to, uh, to uh, give lectures about democracy abroad? 
Well, as, as you know, we do we do all, all of the above. We do all of these things. The the main focus is to uh, encourage dialogue mm -hmm. between the different political parties, the, uh, the different views, the different groups uh, and uh, NGOs. Dialogue is extremely important because that's what democracy at the end is, is all about. It's about uh, compromise. It's about finding a middle ground uh, where everybody agrees on, on the rules of the game and, and people can trust mm -hmm. each other and can work with each other. It's normal to have differences of opinions, but those differences of opinions do not mean that we do not uh, trust each other or do not uh, work with each other, do not respect each other. So our main focus, I would say, is really trying to strengthen a culture of democracy and the mm -hmm. culture of dialogue. Uh, that's what I would... Uh, Dr. Masmoudi, just another question. Sure. Um, we were speaking about trust here and we were talking about uh, this culture of dialogue. Sometimes, um, I mean, is there sometimes some, some worries as far as, for example, uh, funding or, or, or you know having the CSID come directly from Washington into Tunisia. Mm -hmm. I've read a lot about you know the the, NEB, the National Endowment for Democracy, but NDI and IRI sort of uh, uh, this sort of mixture of different associations that people are beginning to tag and categorize in different ways. Is there any has there any been has there been any kind of rejection or any kind of problems that arose because of of the let me tell you that, first of all, CSID has been working uh, in the Arab countries for 12 or 13 years, including in Tunisia, as a matter of fact. Even before the revolution, we have mm -hmm. organized conferences and seminars in Tunisia, even before the revolution. And yes, we hear these questions about funding. You know, you know it's always the first question, where do you get your funding? And we are very, very straightforward. We, we say exactly where our, I mean, uh, we publish uh, as an NGO, we have to publish a financial report and the financial report shows where the funding comes from and it's published on the internet. So it's not, it's uh, public information. It's not secret, you know, no, there's nothing that we do that is secret. But uh, let me tell you about where we get our funding from. As any NGO, funding is always a challenge. It's always a struggle, you know, to come up with the necessary money, uh, resources to, to be able to achieve your goals and your activities. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning, in the first three, four years, we focused almost entirely on uh, memberships and donations from individuals. And we were able to get maybe 50,000, 60,000, 70,000 dollars a year. It was not bad, but clearly it was not enough to, not. Do the, mm -hmm. to do the kind of activities yeah. that we had planned, you know, for in different countries. And, and it, it, these activities it's are expensive. Expensive. Mm -hmm. So in about 2002, 2003, we had to, um, make a decision whether we want to apply to funding from the National Endowment for Democracy, for example, the NED, mm -hmm. or some other, lots of other uh, governmental and non-governmental sources that give funding for NGOs. I mean, mm -hmm. there are tens of thousands of NGOs, and you, s you write a proposal, and if they like your proposal, they might give you funding. If not, you don't get funding. So we, when we discussed this, of course, there was a big heated debate among, among us, but in the end, the decision was we will accept funding as long as it's not conditional. As long as we maintain our integrity and credibility. That they, because they give us money, doesn't mean that they can interfere with what we do. And they can tell us, you, you go do this or don't do this. We have to maintain our independence. We design the projects, the conferences. We decide who to invite and who not to invite. We decide the topics and, and uh, all of that. So, if uh, there is somebody in the United States or in Europe or the United Nations or, or uh, a lot of these forces that is willing to give us money mm -hmm. to, to support our activities, we say yes. If there is a condition, if they try to tell us you have to do this or you just say no. then we say no. It's uh, really as simple as that. And we have rejected uh, grants of uh, a lot of money, up to a million dollars because there were uh, strings attached. Or can, there we know, can we know the sources of such funding? Well, yes, rejected? yes. I mean, um, uh, about, uh, in, I think it was in 2007, we mm -hmm. applied to USAID, US Agency for International Development, for a project in Egypt mm -hmm. uh, to do on citizenship, to do a training program on citizenship. But CSID has been working extensively in the area of citizenship training, you know, to train people on what is citizenship, what does it mean? to be a citizen, what, is your ri what are your rights and your obligation, obligations and how do you really participate and become active. 
Anyway, so in this case, it was a project for Egypt, and we were planning to train about, uh, I, I forgot, 5,000 or 10,000 people with our training uh, manual. And they approved it, and it was up to a million dollars, the, the grant. But then after uh, they approved it, they, said, they came back and they said, oh, by the way, you cannot work with the Muslim Brotherhood. Okay. And, and we said, what do you mean? <laughs> Going to either <laughs> Egypt and avoiding the Muslim yeah, Brotherhood is impossible, uh, Dr. Masmoud. Yeah, we said, we can't, no, we can't work in Egypt and not work with the Muslim Brotherhood. It's impossible. It's impossible. It's impossible. So that's what we told them. And we will lose our credibility if we did sure. that. We, we have to train everybody. Any, anybody who wants to come be trained, whether they are Muslim Brotherhood or not, mm -hmm. they are welcome to come. So we had a long discussion with them. At the end, we ended up rejecting the, the grant mm -hmm. because of this condition. Because okay, so, uh, this condition. Doctor, um, I came across an open letter to Secretary Janet Napolitano uh, of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Mm -hmm. It's quite amazing. More than 400 uh, American scholars, well-known people, have signed a petition. Could you give us more details about this petition, Doctor? Sure. Well, um, as you know, I... Um, do a lot of traveling back and forth between the United States and the Arab world. Mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, on average, I travel about once a month between the United States and one or more countries in the Arab world. And uh, what happened, of course, after 9-11 is they uh, have added uh, a lot of people, a lot of uh, Arab Americans and Muslim Americans mm -hmm. to what they call the watch list. Mm -hmm. um, which is people who they stop at the airport and they ask you what you've been doing and where you were and you know all kinds of questions um, and this list uh, I know for a fact that uh, in 2004-2005 they've added all the leaders of major Arab and Islamic organizations uh, in Washington or in the United States were added to this list uh, just Even scholars, thinkers, yeah, yeah, writers? Yeah. All the leaders, all the people who are well known who are uh, Arab and Islamic or Muslim uh, leaders of these organizations. Was this a strategic mistake? I think so, I think so. I think they were being uh, overly uh, cautious, mm -hmm. you know, and somebody uh, in the Department of Homeland Security decided to add all these names and with the idea that later on they will filter them out and they will take names out. Mm -hmm. But of course uh, it was very easy to add names, but it was very difficult to remove names. Because sure. it turned out <laughs> that once your name is on this list, it's very, very, on the system. <laughs> it's very difficult to get off the, off the list. Uh, so my name unfortunately was added to this uh, watch list in about 2005. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, I have lots of friends and lots of contacts in Washington, in the State Department, in in the government, in Congress, in, in various uh, big think tanks and institutions. But uh, I didn't want to make a big deal out of it. I tried to be patient, you know, and if every time I say, you know, hopefully things are going to, you know, it's going to, they're going to find out that they made a mistake and they're going to resolve it and take mm -hmm. the name off the list. But it kept going uh, on and on for, uh, for about four or five years until about a year ago I decided to go public, you know, as they say, and you know, make a big fuss out of it and make a big noise, which is when we wrote this open letter, it was signed by about 450 people, you know, big names, mm -hmm. and uh, within a month, my name was uh, removed uh, from the list. Do you think they have, the, the, the American authorities have made the uh, same mistake after the revolution, or is it over? Which same mistake? What do you mean? This, the mistake of having the names of uh, prominent uh, political figures, Muslim figures, um, uh, on, on a list mm -hmm. so that they can't travel abroad, they, they just have to stay in the United States. Do you think things have changed after the Tunisian Revolution? I think it, it, are we I, perceived differently in the US? I think it is starting to change. I think they are starting to remove people from the list and to understand uh, that. Uh, uh, they really made a mistake, you know, but they put too many people on the list, people who are innocent and people who are very peaceful, who have nothing to do with violence or extremism and, and who in fact are openly, uh, you know, very outspoken against mm -hmm. violence and terrorism. I mean, these are the people that you should be uh, thanking, uh, not uh, putting on a, on a watch list. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, I think they, they are realizing that their mistake and they are trying to fix it. And, and they have removed uh, lots of people names mm -hmm. from, the, from these lists. Don't you believe, Doctor, that... Including Rashid Ghanoushi, for example. Really? You know, Rashid Ghanoushi, for 10 years, was banned from visiting the United States until only last year that the first time they removed his name from the list and so he was able to visit uh, Washington, you know, in the United States.
Did he attend the the uh, 12th conference? He couldn't attend the 12th conference, uh, unfortunately. He was able to visit uh, in November mm -hmm. of last year. That was his last uh, visit. We held our uh, 12th conference in May, mm -hmm. and he was supposed to be one of the uh, keynote speakers at mm -hmm. that conference. But at the end, uh, you know, he was too busy and, and he couldn't make it. But we had four people from the uh, Constituent Assembly who came and spoke at the conference. Could you give us an idea about this conference, Doctor? Well, the annual conference really is our main event um, uh, of the year. We try to bring a lot of the policy makers, uh, you know, all the big names uh, attend this conference. We usually get about 200 to 300 people, but really very, very important people and, and influential people. Mm -hmm. If you know, the, you probably have heard of the APAC sure. and their annual conference, and, uh, you know, they get about 5,000 people. Mm -hmm. um, so we're trying to do something similar, you know, not as big as APAC, but the same idea. This is our annual conference. This is, this is our big event. We, uh, you, we usually get a lot of big names from all over the world, also from, you, from Washington, to, to attend the conference. Mm -hmm. And what was this uh, year's conference about? Uh, this year's conference uh, was focused on, the, uh, of course, the uh, revolutions, you know, the Arab Spring and uh, how to make it uh, work, how to make it succeed, mm -hmm. uh, what are the main challenges. Uh, we, we have people from different countries talking about their challenges, but also what can the United States do to help uh, these countries in their transitions uh, to democracy. Dr. Masmoudi, you've mentioned APAC right now. Yes. Um, do you try to, to do, you have, do you make a conscious effort of trying to act perhaps as a counterweight to APAC or because you said we're trying to do something similar, is there an intention in that? Well, the intention is to, uh, to influence policy making, it's mm -hmm. to, uh, to get our message across. This is normal in a democracy. Uh, Any kind of lobbying involved? It, it's you normal. That, that, no, that's how democracies function. Yeah. You know, it's normal. You have lobbying, which means groups of citizens who get together and organize their, themselves and they try to get their message across mm -hmm. to, through the media or to Congress or people in the government. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's trying to uh, affect you know, the, the policies of the United States. Of course, APAC is focused on one issue, which is Israel and how to help Israel. This is the only thing that APAC cares about. For us, what we really care about is the issue of democracy in the Arab world and in the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. And we focused on convincing the United States to stop supporting dictators. This was our main focus. And again, these lobbies are usually focused on one thing. You cannot affect policies if you do too much, if you try to uh, address too many issues. All of these lobbies or all of these organizations usually are very focused on one particular issue. In our case, it is what we can do to promote democracy in, mm -hmm. the, in the Arab world. I'll just ask you one, one more question. You sure. said that, for, well, you know, CSID has been, uh, it's, it was established, let's say, founded how many years ago? 15? In 1999, so, so about 13, 13, years, 13 years, years, yes. And uh, you said that your main goal was to, to encourage or to, to promote, to promote uh, well, to encourage the U.S. to stop dealing with dictators, yes. to stop mm -hmm. supporting them. Now, in f 12 years out of 13 years, do you think that there was any effect? There? Yes. Because, I mean, I know that the U.S. was always a supporter of Ben Ali, even, I mean, until 2011, No, actually, actually, uh, you are wrong. I know that there are people who think that, okay. but uh, it can be demonstrated. Oh. Yes, please, uh, go ahead. <laughs> with we have the impression that the U.S. was always supporting no. dictators in the Arab world. No, I mean, U.S. has been supporting dictators in the Arab world for the last 40 or 50 years. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. uh, in the last 10 to 12 years, there has been a slow, gradual, mm -hmm. but definite shift in the U.S. policies toward the Arab world and toward dictators in the Arab world. And we played a key role. We were not alone. I would not say that CSID did it by itself. Mm -hmm. There were lots of other organizations that also worked uh, on the same theme. But we were convinced that this was the wrong policy that this was dangerous for the United States to keep supporting dictators in the Arab world because it is turning public opinion in the Arab world against the United States. Okay. So this is obviously dumb. This is stupid. It's mm -hmm. not in the interest of the United States to support one man like Ben Ali or Mubarak against the, the, will, of the will of the people. 
you know, 10 million or in the case of Egypt, 80 million people. So we worked very hard to convince the United States to realize that this is, was a dangerous policy and that the United States needed to change uh, its policy in favor of democracy, in favor of supporting real and genuine democracy. This was gradual, mm -hmm. but I know for a fact that uh, in 2004 when Ben Ali came to Washington, he was uh, received in a very, very strong, he received a very strong message from Bush and the uh, uh, U.S. Congress and, uh, about the, and the government about democracy and they told him in very, very clear terms that if you don't really implement these specific reforms that they uh, gave him basically a list mm -hmm. of things that he needed to do to put Tunisia on the path of reform and democracy and, and liberalization and, and and you know freedoms. That's, mm -hmm. that's around the, the year of the MIPI initiative, right? Yes, so yes, it, it was about the same time, but uh, as you know, he, Ben Ali, three times before that, was mm -hmm. planned to come to Washington and the trip was cancelled at the last minute. Okay. This also, was a political decision. It was a political decision. It was and a message as well. It was cancelled by the United States mm -hmm. because Ben Ali, um, before he came to Washington, or his, he was scheduled to come to Washington, they would mm -hmm. ask him to make some changes. Mm -hmm. Because the image of Tunisia in Washington, in the United States at the time, was very bad, about human rights and about dictatorship and all that. And, and so it was not possible for the United States to invite a dictator in Washington and to welcome him with open arms. They needed him to make some changes in order to be able to come to Washington. And he refused four times to make these changes. Mm -hmm. So three times they cancelled the visit in three days before the before he came, before he was supposed to come, like two or three days they would just cancel the visit. They said there is no point. If you're gonna come it's not it's gonna be a disaster. Uh, the fourth time they decided to let him come but give him a very stern and strong message while he was there. And since two thousand and four the relations between the United States and Tunisia and the regime of course, the Ben Ali regime, have been extremely tense. Uh, and unfriendly, and this is documented also in uh, WikiLeaks, for example. Okay, if you re if you read what the ambassador was saying about uh, Ben Ali and about the kind, of, what kind of uh, leader he was, what kind of uh, re regime we had, uh, it was very very strong, and the relationship really deteriorated, you know, uh, seriously uh, from 2004. Yeah. Doctor, um, do you know about the latest from Syria? This is the second day. Um, of the holy month of Ramadan and heavy clashes between troops and rebels rage into a second day in Syria's second city, Aleppo, on Saturday. Activists say while a tense calm reigned in Damascus after days of fierce fighting. This is very sad, doctor. What do you think about the situation in Syria? I, I think, again, it is very sad. I agree with you and, and we are... Uh, it's terrible what has been happening in Syria for the last year uh, or year and a half. It started as a very peaceful demonstrations, if you remember, in Syria for the first nine or ten months. Mm -hmm. They were very peaceful demonstrations, but the army started shooting at them. They never wanted to use violence, and they didn't use violence. They, the, the Libyan, I mean, the Syrian uh, Free Army mm -hmm. uh, was uh, in, in, in basically in trying to defend the, the innocent civilians. Uh, so we have a regime that is willing to uh, kill as many people hundreds of thousands. hundreds of thousands as many people as it takes and just to remain in power to remain in power and and this is very very bad and the syrian people i don't think can take it i mean obviously will this cannot continue i mean the regime cannot continue i think that's obvious uh, what is the price and how long it will take only god knows we don't know how long it's going to be um, of course, it would, have be, it would be easier if there was foreign intervention, because foreign intervention can stop it mm -hmm. right now. But it also comes at a cost. You know, foreign intervention also has a big cost. Mm -hmm. The Syrian people chose not to ask for foreign intervention. And this was a wise decision, if they can do it. Yeah. The price has so far has been high. 15,000 people have been killed. Uh, but I think the end is near. I think the... the there you are think it's just a matter of time? I think it's a matter of time, but... Uh, what do you think it's a matter of political decisions? I think that the timing is that something might happen this month, in the month of Ramadan. The month of Ramadan gives people a lot of uh, Power. faith. Mm -hmm. You know, this is why the uh, month of Ramadan is always associated with victories in our history. Mm -hmm. The people become strong and they say, you know, I'm willing to die 
for my cause, sacrifice. For, to sacrifice for my cause, or for my family, for my nation. And if the people rise up, you know, 30 million people, I don't think they can be defeated, you know, by an army. It doesn't matter how strong that army is. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the situation in Syria, I, uh, the International Relations Association, Tunisia, a uh, young association, is uh, mm -hmm. carrying out its first scientific opinion poll. And what they're going to do is they're going to try to ask people from different categories in society, from different, um, you know, women, men, children, aged, mm -hmm. younger, about how they view the Tunisian revolution and how they think Tunisia should change its foreign policy more or less. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there's a, there are some questions about the situation in Syria as a study case of what they think Tuni the, the role that Tunisia wants, needs to play from mm -hmm. now on mm -hmm. in international affairs. So the opinion poll begins on July 25th and mm -hmm. the results will be published all over. Oh, uh, it already begun? Uh, ju uh, July 25th. Oh, 25th, okay. Yeah. So. They can pass, uh, post the link on our Facebook page, of FTC, course. the English yeah. language. Uh, Dr. Graham Moody, uh, my question is about the uh, transition to democracy, um, do you really believe that uh, transition to democracy is, uh, is possible in uh, Tunisia? Because today, w when you watch the, uh, the constituent assembly, uh, the live uh, programs, it's, it's more interesting than uh, NBC2 or uh, watching uh, uh, movies or going to the theater. Uh, you think that uh, it's not really democracy, it's a kind of chaos theory of the Constituent Assembly. Why other people claim that it's normal? Uh, it's normal, we are just learning, we are beginning. It's the, uh, the, the first step and uh, uh, in the future everything will be okay. Well, let me say that uh, I think, uh, of course, the transition to democracy is a very, very difficult process uh, because not only we have to change the laws and mm -hmm. the institutions, mm -hmm. like we're writing a new constitution, for, for example, so all of these have to be changed, which mm -hmm. takes time. But also we have to change the culture. And this is extremely important. The culture of democracy takes time. It takes time for people to learn to listen to each other, to talk to each other, to respect each other, and to build consensus. Mm -hmm. Not to hold on to one position no matter what, but to try to always come to an agreement. Because at the end of the day, that's how you find solutions. You have to negotiate a solution that's not a hundred percent with either side, but everybody can find itself, can find that is acceptable to, uh, to them. So this, this is why it takes time, you know, to, for transitions to democracy. And in all the other countries where this has happened, it takes at least five years and usually ten years. For ten years? At least, yes. At mm -hmm. least five, usually about eight to ten years for a country to, be, to become really democratic you know, for the institutions of democracy to be developed and for the culture of democracy to start yes, to, to start to become a dominant culture. We might have a little bit of it, but it's not the dominant culture. So my first advice and my in, uh, and to all Tunisians is first of all to be patient, mm -hmm. that this process takes time. Secondly, to be optimistic because it will succeed in Tunisia, inshallah, because Tunisia has all the right ingredients if you compare us to any other country in the Arab world, we have better chances than any other country to succeed, for democracy to succeed in Tunisia. What do you think we have better chances? Oh, for lots of reasons. For some, first of all, we have good educational system. Mm -hmm. We have a literacy rate is very low. Uh, we have a, a homogeneous country, a small country, but homogeneous. Mm -hmm. um, we, are, uh, uh, we have good infrastructure. We are... Uh, uh, we don't have a lot of poverty, we have good women rights that have been developed in the last 50 or 60 years. Women are educated in Tunisia and they participate in, in everything in the society. So we are, re we are close, we are ready. In fact, for the last 10 years I've been saying that Tunisia is ready for democracy for, except for one thing, mm -hmm. which was Ben Ali. <laughs> and Ben Ali is gone. No, he's gone yeah. We are ready for democracy, we just have to be a little bit more patient. And I think what we have already achieved in the last year and a half is remarkable. It's amazing. The whole world is really amazed by what we have accomplished already in just one year and a half. So why are people um, pessimistic about the uh, situation and about the future? Because there are challenges, there are difficulties. It's a revolution that we had and revolutions are not easy. Mm -hmm. You know, you, are remove, you remove the regime 
uh, and when you move regime, you have lots of people in that in that administration who belong to the old regime, and you have to change them because that's why we have we had a revolution. But you change it with what? You're going to bring people who don't have experience. Mm -hmm. This is natural. This is the this is in a transition to democracy, or especially if there is a revolution, which is even more worse, because there are two kinds of transitions to democracy. There is a transition where the government in place adopts the idea of a transition. So the government does not is not changed, but it uh, takes time. Mm -hmm. This process uh, takes more time, but it's easier when the government is in agreement. Unfortunately, this did not happen in Tunisia or in Egypt. The government refused to, be, uh, to do any, any real reforms, mm -hmm. so we had to have a revolution. We had the people had to say enough is enough and we are fed up. So uh, that is a more costly process because you have basically you have to change the regime and you have to bring people who don't have the same experience because we don't trust the old people anymore we don't trust the old the people who are in the, the system mm -hmm. and this makes it more difficult because you have people who in government who are new in the various ministries who are new in the municipalities who are new mm -hmm. they, are, they really don't know how to do it but that's normal after a revolution because the only people who know how to do it are the people who are associated with the old <laughs> regime yeah. And that's why we had the revolution. We don't want them to be... Uh, Do you think we have to get rid of them? I think we, it has to be a slow process mm -hmm. and, and, and we have to get rid of the bad apples. Not all of them are bad. So it is a difficult... This is why... Uh, it's of the a, whole tree. Uh, yes, it's a difficult process because we have to identify who are really the bad apples, who are the corrupt people, mm -hmm. who are the people who... Uh, do not follow the law and who took bribes and who uh, re were responsible for the corruption and all those things. Doctor, one last question. Yes. You have less than one minute. Uh, this morning I have attended the uh, conference of the newly born baby in the uh, on the political scene in Tunisia. Uh, I don't like the use of the term baby, but this is how uh, a journalist this morning described Hazb al Tahrir. Mm -hmm. um, Hazb al Tahrir has his, its own vision of the political scene in Tunisia. Uh, do you think it's normal that uh, this party exists and operates in Tunisia? Look, I have no doubt that once we pass the constitution, which mm -hmm. will hopefully be in about six months or something like that from now, all the political parties must sign an oath, must take an oath that they will uphold this constitution. And at that point, any party that respects the constitution and upholds the constitution, I have no problem with. Do you think Hizb tahrir will sign it? But I don't think, I don't think Hizb tahrir will sign it. Mm -hmm. So I think that this uh, visa that they got will be very short-lived, mm -hmm. because six months from now they will refuse to sign the constitution. And it doesn't make any sense for a political party to exist if it doesn't recognize the basic laws of that country. What if they sign the constitution only to keep their visa up and then... I mean, I'm sure not all parties that sign that in, in, agree, in, in agreement to the constitution necessarily have the intention of following everything. Well, we cannot judge the intentions of people. This is, this, is, <laughs> this is the problem of Ben Ali regime yeah. and of the dictators. They try to judge on the intentions. We cannot judge on the intentions. We will have the answer in six, in six okay, months. Yeah. We can only judge based on their actions and also what they say, mm -hmm. whether they believe in democracy or not and whether they respect they the constitution or not. Exactly. Dr. Rathwan Masmoudi, president of the uh, CSID, Center for the Study of Islam, and democracy in Washington DC and in Tunis, yes. in Tunisia as well. Thank you very much for coming, thank for sharing you. your thoughts. Um, I would like to thank Wee Amshat Tewi, thank you for your contribution. Enis Lurimi, the maestro, Enis Lurimi, thank you very much for your valuable assistance. Next, a news update in French and the German language program with Mossov. I'll be back next Sunday. Thank you very much. Bye. Je te conseille, c'est que ça, c'est que ça.